Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, in this episode, I team up with special guest Carl Burrows, a serial entrepreneur with more than 20 years of experience in the dental industry. This episode is a must for buyers and sellers in the health and dental sectors alike. Together, Carl and I dive into the high demand for dental practices Carl provides smart tips for sellers, emphasising the importance of planning ahead, making strategic investments and considering post-sale benefits. This captivating conversation showcases Carl's expertise and passion for the dental sector and it provides insights that will leave you inspired and eager for more. So tune in and get ready for this industry spotlight on dental. Fasten your seatbelts, get ready for an insightful episode with Carl. Carl, thank you so much for joining me on the Deal Room podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, um, Joanna. It's uh, been a while and uh, I'm very, very <laughs> delighted to be involved. <laughs> okay, now, Carl, you and I have worked together. I would say it has been for two decades now. I say two decades because that sounds even longer than 20 years. But I think it's been two decades that we have worked together. Um, And so there there are a million things that I want um, to talk about in this episode today uh, because there's so much to drill into um, in talking about the dental industry. But why don't we start by perhaps you give us a really quick snapshot of your background in the dental industry because it's such an interesting background and um, and it leads to where you are today um, in Ray White in a very interesting meandering course. But give us a quick snapshot. Yes, thank you very much. It, it's, um, it wasn't by design to begin with. Uh, I sort of fell into dentistry. Um, I purchased a marketing company uh, back in the early 2000s and uh, we were then concentrating on helping all businesses with marketing. You probably remember and um, I got invited to speak at an orthodontic uh, meeting through a very good friend of mine Derek Mahoney and um, I don't think I could have spelt orthodontic back then um, but dentistry and the specializations had just gone through deregulation and uh, he was intrigued to get somebody to talk about marketing so I went down and uh, I was very fortunate. I picked up uh, a couple of clients who became friends, at, you know, at that evening, and that sort of got me into it. Um, and it wasn't very long before I realised that a I was enjoying working with the profession, and um, secondly, uh, because there really nobody else was out there to help, they needed some help with their marketing. So that's I've been doing that now for 22 years and still do that through my company, Integrated Dental Marketing. But that has spun me out into other aspects. As I got more involved in the profession, I got involved in running dental practices. Um, firstly, through a couple of corporations who asked me to, um, to actually manage practices for them. And then more recently, I've been buying a few practices for myself. And then I've also been involved in the formation of uh, dental corporations. Uh, namely um, Dental Partners, which today is known as Maven. So yes, it's a, it's a sort of long and winding road, as the Beatles would say. Um, but today I'm very pleased to be involved in a national Ray White uh, franchise that specializes in the sale um, of dental practices. Uh, and I must say it's a, sort of a combination of what I've learned over the last 22 years. I'm able to use that, that for the seller to help the seller get the best a possible deal. I just think, uh, you know, I, I find it a fascinating story because um, you have so many insights from so many different perspectives on the dental industry as, as a whole. But but I also think it's such a unique, um, a, a unique viewpoint, but set of skills that you bring um, to the broking, broking, you know, um, selling and or assisting uh, 
a dental practice owners to buy dental practices that I really feel hasn't been there in the market. And I mean, you know, because it's such a unique skill set. Um, and so what are some of what some of the thoughts that you came into this role um, with in your mind as to the changes that you can make within the industry of selling dental practices? Um, I really felt that it was what the offerings out there were very lightweight and so they were very singular. Um, they were offering this single thing of promoting a dental practice almost like an estate agent promotes a house but with really little more depth than that. And in, in my work with my own practices, you know, I dig deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into them, finding out all the matrices that make them work. Um, I must say it drives my staff nuts, but I ask about everything and I want to know everything. Because the more knowledge you have on your businesses, the more that you can actually replicate the things that you like. So when it comes to actually selling a practice, um, there's just so much more than that's on the surface. So, for instance, the, uh, the demographic of the database, uh, you know, I don't see a lot of information out there about that. Yes, that makes a huge difference. Um, in, in my own practices, the practices that I've purchased for myself, I have targeted uh, practices that the database has not overly been worked. So I've, I picked a beautiful practice seven years ago, lovely dentist selling it. But he wasn't into really high-end dentistry, and I knew I had the, um, the, the, the dentists to provide high-end dentistry. So that database had a latent value to me uh, that only I could see if I actually studied the, the work that had been done in that practice. And these are the sort of things, and that's one of literally a, a hundred other things that I feel are important when assessing whether you know somebody should buy a practice, but therefore... Um, the opportunity to promote that practice in a certain way that's going to get the uh, the interest of a certain buyer and therefore add value. No, I mean, that's exactly right, isn't it? That it's about when, when you're selling a business, it's about the opportunities that you can identify for buyers. And I just think, you know, it's obviously that you're in such a unique position to be able to help identify for sellers things that they may have had no idea are actually opportunities within their business for a buyer. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's one of the things that definitely drives drives me uh, is to you know due diligence very normally sort of focuses on the financial side of the practice and that's obviously very important and something that you, you help people with and it may pick up a, a few of the KPIs size of the database but I've even seen you know sales go through where that information isn't it isn't recorded. You know the activity of that database you know how often patients come back you know so there might be a, a patient base of 500 but is it only a thousand of them active is that a positive thing is that a negative thing so by drilling down um, i feel the the salary is getting better value from uh, from as at ray white because we're able to you know attract different buyers and then educate that buyer and therefore to actually maximize their return on their, their lifetime of investment um, because if you know what you're buying, if you can see there's more value in there than what's just on the surface, you walk in, you know, they've all got dental chairs and people can say, oh, the value of that dental chair is and the, the age of it and it may break down and that might be some part of their due diligence process. But that becomes an irrelevant situation if they go, this practice has never done orthodontics, I do orthodontics. And therefore, you know, I could be introducing that service to these people and look at the database. There's there's an awful lot of teenage children who probably want some level of liner therapy coming through the ranks. That might be worth hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of dollars over a period of time. Um, so the, the state of the dental chair to me is almost irrelevant. Such a good point. I absolutely love that point. And, and I guess as we're talking about that, let's sort of um, reflect as well on the state of the market, um, uh, where we are right now. Um, we have been through so many different periods <laughs> in uh, the dental industry. Where do you feel that we are at the moment? Is it a good time to sell? Is it a bad time to sell? It's, it's an interesting time, for sure. Um, the, what I've seen is um, a shift from dentists wanting to you know, work at other practices. I mean, pre-COVID, pre 
you know, a, a younger dentist may actually have to work across three practices to stay busy five days a week. That's all completely gone, as we know. Um, but that same dentist no, really doesn't want to be an employee. So there's, there's, they're entering the purchasing cycle probably five or six earlier than, uh, years earlier than they were before that COVID period. Uh, I don't think that those two things are actually linked, by the way. I think it's just a moment in time. Um, I think it's more of a, a demographic change in our society than anything to do with the pandemic. It just, I think those two things are just coincided and it would have happened anyway. It's same with the shortage of staff. Um, there is certainly a shortage of staff within, within the dental sector as there is pretty much in every sector. And I think I was fooled into thinking that was a COVID related um, event. They, you know, we've closed down, um, we've sent our staff off, they've all gone and worked at Woolworth stacking shelves at $45 an hour, which is more than we pay them. So now they're, they've, they've taken stock of their life and maybe gone off. I think all that's actually rubbish. You know, that's, that was my thinking uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And I feel like this shift would have happened anyway. If you just look at the demographics of Australia, it would have, it would have shifted anyway. So uh, it's certainly an interesting time. Uh, is it a good time? Well, there's lots and lots of buyers. So I would say yes. I think it's as simple as that. Whenever you want to sell something, if you've got a high demand, then you're going to get the very best possible return, you know, on, on that, I say that lifetime of uh, investment. Yeah, absolutely. And and while we're on that note, then maybe we talk about some tips um, for sellers of dental practices. What are some of the things that they should be thinking about um, in terms of preparing themselves for sale and, and understanding who their potential buyer might be? Well, everybody's circumstances are, are very different, of course, and their motivation for sale uh, could be very different as well. But broadly, if you've got the luxury of time, which, you know, if it's just, if it's been instigated through an aging process, then you probably have got the luxury of time. Think well in advance, well in advance. You know, if you're going to hang around um, and work post sale, or you, you're willing to, then that has a very, very high value at the moment because replacing that dentist is incredibly hard. Now, there are still dentists buying a practice who want to have a, an almost a walk in, walk out environment because they want the patient base. That tends to be for the smaller practice. So they may only want the, the, the seller to hang around for six months or a year. But that isn't the bulk of buyers. The bulk of buyers are wanting to either add a second practice or a third practice to their group, um, or they, they want to be working uh, in a practice where the, the seller stays on because then that means there's, there's actually just physically more dentists. And then obviously there's all the reputational benefit of the, the seller staying on. So if you've got the luxury of time, and uh, in fact, you know, without giving any uh, names away, I'm working with a client in Melbourne at the moment who's 57 years old uh, and he's determined that he won't pick up uh, a drill after the age of 60. So we've got three years, he's got three years that he's happy to stay on. In his situation, um, I feel his practice isn't maximized for certain reasons. So I'm, I'm advising that he doesn't put it on the market, but he goes holus bolus out to build his practice for 12 months. And then he's got two years after that where he can stay stay on uh, if the incoming buyer would like that. So each person's circumstances is uh, is very different. Um, the other piece that I, I would advise, and again, this depends on obviously who you're selling to, because who you're selling to and the size of your practice really determines how the practice is appraised and therefore the the, the ultimate sale price. The larger the practice and the larger the revenue and the larger the, the profits, the more likely you're going to have you know, larger buyers and they will probably buy it based on a multiple of you know, EBITDA or another matrix. The smaller the practice, it tends to be more opportunities, um, even down to a point where it's a very small practice, it could be really just the, the value of the fit out and, and the small amount for goodwill. So obviously all of those things vary. Um, but if you can try and remember that in broadly speaking, um, if you're adding extra profits to the bottom line of your, your business, there's, that's going to be multiplied. And in, in our normal lives, that doesn't really happen. You know, if we put, you know, $100,000 in the bank 
it's going to be worth you know $107,000 this time next year at absolute best. But if you put $100,000 of profit into your, into your business because you've increased your turnover, then that could be worth four, five, or six hundred thousand dollars more to that business. Now that's an, an incredibly amazing opportunity. So having knowing that there is a multiplier factor, which obviously varies per practice, I think people if they start planning early and go, you know what, we haven't done everything we possibly can. We could do more. We could go hard for a couple of years and add another million dollars to the value of our business. And by the way, in that period of time, they're earning more revenue for themselves as well. So there's no downside. Um, so, yeah, that's a bit of advice. And I, I have to throw in there, I think absolutely right. I think one of the biggest mistakes I see sellers make in this market, but it's actually across the board in uh, most other industries as well, is coming into a sale too late um, when they've run out of energy to um, to do what they need to do to make changes in the business. They've run out of time to make changes in the business before they want to get out. And dental is one of those industries where there really is, you know, a massive difference quite often in value and pool of buyers between um, someone who's willing to, the period of time that, um, that a seller is willing to stay on with the business for. And it's just often, you know, I find sellers just don't really seriously think about selling until they're they're emotionally at that point that they just want to act right now. And that's too late to make the most out of their sale. Absolutely. I suppose it's been strategic, isn't it? And, you know, if you think of a real estate analogy, if you've got a nice house, the real estate agent comes along and says, you need to do your garden. Now, you know that you need to do your garden for the last 10 years, but you need to landscape your garden. You need to do this. You need to put some nice furniture and, and, and groom it for sale. And if you do, you're going to get a higher, you know, higher price. In a dental environment, those that grooming situation is about making sure that your marketing looks fresh and is up to date. Um, your internal systems are, you know, really up to date and working well. Things that if you're busy in a dental practice and it's working and you're making some money, um, it's very easy to go put that in the too hard basket. You kind of know, and I think in our, I actually think in all of our businesses, Joanna, there's the metaphoric box we should have moved and then we're still stepping over it. But, you know, it, when, when the box is obvious and it needs to be moved, then thinking about that well in advance and having the time to implement the systems, the marketing, the fresh lick of paint, and knowing what will attract a buyer definitely adds a significant value. And it also broadens your market. Um, you know, if, if, if the practice is almost depressing, uh, which some practices can be for various reasons, um, then you're going to find that it doesn't inspire the buyer unless they can see the vision of saying, well, I can turn this around. But then the seller is not getting the maximum return. Well, look, Carl, um, this has been um, a hopefully very illuminating for our audience who are listening to it, particularly if they are looking to sell a dental practice or indeed buy one and understand some of the opportunities that they should be looking for in an acquisition. I feel we've only just scratched the surface. I feel like we need to come back and do uh, part two of this series very soon. And Carl, so how do our listeners, if they're looking um, to um, sell, exit their practice anytime in the next five to 10 years, um, how do they get in contact with you? So very easily, and I would strongly recommend if anybody just wants to chat, uh, just to contact us. We're incredibly generous with our time. Uh, we're, we're not in any any hurry. Uh, we want to make sure that people have uh, prepared, and, and then you know and we'll be around in five years, so you know ten years. So if the if somebody wants to have a chat, that's great. The best way of getting in touch is, is through the website, which is raywhitepracticesales.com. Um, or feel free to ring me directly, which is 0416-190-000. And there is, there is no cost in, at all in that process. It's just our way of getting to know the practice and being able to give you the sort of advice we've been talking about today. Um, that's, that's our gift to our potential clients. And uh, the, the sooner we get to talk to people, the better it is for us as well, Joanna. You know, it's, uh, there's nothing worse than getting that phone call and saying, when do you want to sell or today? and uh, I need to be out in six months time. It's, it means that we're not being able to market and get all the buyers we need uh, to get the absolute best value for the client. 
Brilliant. Look, and it makes complete sense. You, you know, it's such an easy thing to work out what the value of your practice might actually be if you've got no idea to um, to get an appraisal. So we'll put all of those um, links in the show notes. Uh, so uh, if you're running along the beach or you're in your commute at the moment as you're listening to this podcast, you can easily access Carl and Ray White Practice Sales or click through and get yourself an appraisal organized. But for now, Carl, I just want to say thank you so much for coming onto the show. Very welcome and lovely to see you again. Well, that's it for this episode of the Deal Room Podcast. We hope you're now primed for your next deal with these pointers and have enjoyed these fascinating insights. Now, if you'd like more information about this topic, then head over to our website at the Deal Room Podcast. Dot com, where you'll be able to download a transcript of this episode, as well as access any contact details and any other additional information we referred to in today's podcast. Now, if you'd like to get in contact with our guests today and the services they offer, you can go ahead and check out our show notes for a link right through to them and their details. You can also book in directly with our legal legals at Aspect Legal if you'd like to soundboard your next steps, discuss a legal question, or find out more how we can assist, whether that's with buying or selling a business, or perhaps somewhere in between. Now, don't forget to subscribe to the Deal Room podcast on your favorite podcast player to get notifications whenever a new episode is out. We'd also love to hear your feedback, so please leave us a review and rating if you're already one of our subscribers or even if you're listening to this podcast for the very first time. Every review helps our team produce valuable content for you. Well, thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition so see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 